gas-lighted streets, spotless front steps, colorful screen paintings. These, you say, are Baltimore. True, but Baltimore, like most American cities, is also block after block of incredibly bad housing. I'm a worker for the Baltimore Housing Bureau. I had a job that hot summer day to find someone in the neighborhood with whom the Housing Bureau could work. There were great plans to rehabilitate this area, but plans have only a paper and pencil reality. Without a neighborhood leader, someone known and liked, our plans would get about as far as a painted bird on a window screen. I had, of course, the name of someone who sounded perfect for the job, but I wasn't sure of the address. This was more than just a routine day's work for me. I believed in the plan we were working on. And somehow, I must have felt that all the people in the neighborhood were just waiting for me. It seemed like another world, deserted, unpeopled, but not without a life of its own. It is another world, I suppose, to most people, an urban jungle. But though it may seem a jungle in its ugliness and disorder, its real life is in the people who live here, the only place they have to live, people with the same kindliness and neighborliness as elsewhere. But I wasn't doing too well in my search. It was though I'd stepped into a strange city, a city from which all people had fled. Besides that, it was hot. At this rate, it'd take years to get anything done. It would already taken long enough to accomplish what we had. But at least we'd done something about things like this. Here is the shame of our American cities. Here is the face of our cities we hide. Endless blocks of houses scarred beyond belief, overcrowded fire traps, tenements, shacks, human dwellings unfit for human beings to live in. In Baltimore, as in all large cities, such conditions went untouched for years. Then, a new approach. A young social worker just out of school went into a blighted area to report on the work of social agencies. She was shocked by the housing conditions she saw. Her report, an indictment of Baltimore's indifference, interested three people. The director of public welfare, the commissioner of health, and a newspaper editor. newspaper hit hard. To the people of Baltimore, such conditions were impossible. But there they were, as common as the daily paper. The paper kept hammering away week after week, month after month, and gradually the impact mounted. Aroused by the hard-hitting news stories, groups of citizens organized the Citizens Planning and Housing Association and met with city officials. There were more months of delays, but eventually, the determined action of organized citizens brought results. A new housing ordinance was drafted. It was a housing ordinance with this difference. It outlined minimum standards for health and decency. The next step, the formation of a division of housing in the city health department. Its job, not to wait for complaints, but to go out and investigate. Its authority, to notify owners and landlords of violations and take legal action where necessary. But investigating, uncovering violations was just part of the new approach. The facts had to be brought to public attention time and again. The facts of the hidden costs of slums. A fire casualty. Here was the direct appeal to the conscience of influential Baltimore. 
its businessmen, its lawyers, its clergymen. A rat bite case. Lack of fundamental sanitation. A Baltimore playground. The campaign of community education went on. Young people were given first-hand knowledge of the problems and of a newly drawn plan to concentrate housing law enforcement in one block in the vast blighted area of 2,000 blocks, a test block. For the first time, an American city had selected a specific area to inspect instead of waiting for complaints to come in from tenants. It was a thoroughgoing investigation of all fire, building, and health violations in block number one. The next step, the courts. This case came before another court last month? Yes, Your Honor, and it was postponed two times before that by two other judges. Well, I'm not going to postpone it. I've just disposed of a case of murder. I have two other crimes of violence on my docket, six cases of armed robbery, one of assault with intent to kill. You say this landlord is guilty of violating the housing code. Well, I'm just too busy with cases involving robbery and violence to bother with a case involving a uh, leaky rain spout. Case dismissed. There'll be a five minute recess. I'll be seeing you. Violations were uncovered by the thousands. Violators brought into the magistrate's courts by the hundreds. Results, weeks and months of postponements and delays, cases shunted from court to court, civic indifference. Results in block number one, disappointment and resignation on the part of tenants forced to live in and pay rent for slum dwellings. The continuation of blight with its attendant hidden costs of human misery and deprivation. The housing law enforcement program for which so many had had such high hopes seemed unworkable. But then something happened. Once again, the determined action of organized citizens brought results. Mr. Helen, I've gone over the facts involved in your case very, very carefully. I find that you make your living from being in the real estate business. But when you rent a house, you contract not only between yourself and your tenant, but also with the community. This is the third time that you've been before this court. You've had ample time. I think that the city has been more than fair in this case. The houses you rent, houses which you do not keep in decent livable condition, are a menace not only to your tenants, but to the city of Baltimore. Mr. Hallam, I therefore find you guilty, and the fine is $50 and costs. Oh, Next case. I'll be seeing you. A housing court, the first of its kind in the country. A special magistrate's court to handle all housing cases and only housing cases. Here were the basic ideas of the Baltimore plan at last. Make minimum housing standards a legal requirement and then enforce the laws. The Baltimore plan was on its way. Yes, but now the Baltimore plan was to be tested, not just with single blocks, but with a neighborhood of 27 blocks. This was to be the big test. Education, social services, law enforcement, citizen groups, all resources of the community working with the people living in a blighted neighborhood. If I could find a neighborhood leader. Was this woman the leader I was looking for? No, she was not. I was about ready to give up. I'd never find her. But just then... Come here, mother, mother! Bye. 
all be stuck in this old pipe. What'll we do, Mrs. Turner? Bobby was more frightened than hurt. Mrs. Turner, the woman I talked to, knew right away what to do. She sent the men of the neighborhood for tools to work with. And then she asked me to help. Would I go for a policeman? I surely would. But before I could get two steps away, she asked me to bring back something else. It was just what was needed for the occasion. Okay, girl. Okay, the men of the neighborhood soon got busy. And before long, there was much excitement among the children of the neighborhood. Oh, oh Mrs. Turner, Mrs. Turner, look! Ice cream cone. Ice An cream. ice cream cone. Just what Mrs. Turner had ordered. And it really turned a trick. Almost before you could say Jack Robinson, Bobby's leg was free. Here was a cooperative spirit we needed for our program. Here was natural kindliness and neighborliness. And here at last, in Mrs. Turner, I'd found the neighborhood leader we needed. From that point on, Mrs. Turner and I had a long talk. I told her that D'Alessandro had formed a Citizens Advisory Council to assist the program. The Baltimore plan was now moving into high gear. We brought in the facilities of the United States Public Health Service to measure housing conditions in the pilot area before the program and after. Out of 2,000 blocks of blight, 27 blocks. This was the target, the goal a systematic tabulation of the before conditions in the pilot area. House by house, the inspectors worked carefully, painstakingly, feeding their reports back to the Housing Bureau. Defective wiring, fire hazards, structural weaknesses, plumbing, falling ceiling, rat infested basement, outside structural toilet, weakness, overcrowding, falling ceiling, wiring, garbage, rat infested basement, outside toilet, structural weakness, effective falling garbage, ceiling, fire rat infested basement, fire hazards, structural, structural weakness, effective wiring, falling ceiling, rat infested basement, overcrowding, wiring, structural weakness, fire hazards, structural weakness, effective wiring, structural weakness, fire hazards, falling ceiling, outside The U.S. Public Health Service survey was completed. We know now what has to be done, Mrs. Turner. And that's where you come in. People like you and respect you. Will you take the job of volunteer neighborhood chairman? Mrs. Turner looked out across the backyards and said, I'll be happy to. And so my work began. And as I found out, it was a day and night job. There were committee meetings, home visits, conferences. Most of our committees met at Pilot House. A church group had converted to a community center, the worst slum house in the neighborhood. It served us both as an example of rehabilitation and as a social service referral center. With the help of Pilot House and the Housing Bureau, my two chief assistants found block captains, men and women who were willing to work and work hard in their own blocks. We met to plan our part in a citywide effort to interest and involve all the people in the pilot program, city officials, Schools, newspapers, social agencies, individuals, everyone planned for the Blitz block. <laughs> this was enough drama to involve even the most indifferent. It was a wholesale attack on one block, with the block captain, the mayor, and the heads of the city departments officiating. It was good to know that the city officials meant business. It was good to know, too, what could be done, and soon, Throughout the 27 blocks, the walls came a tumbling down. And then after the tearing down, the rebuilding, the repairing. Hard work began to pay off. Soon, the houses and yards of the pilot area took on a different look. But there were problems. Some owner-occupants simply could not afford repair costs. Solution. I urged them to go before the hearing board, which might recommend assistance from the Fight Blight Fund, a fund contributed by trade organizations and businessmen. Assistance rendered. Long-term loans without interest, if necessary, with repayments based on ability to repay. The Fight Blight Fund helped many owner-occupants in this way. 
but there were other problems. In my duties as neighborhood chairman, I worked with all kinds of people, many who hindered, many more who helped. I had my share of surprises and disappointments. I met with indifference at times, with refusal to cooperate on the part of landlords. And I met with indifference, refusal to cooperate on the part of tenants. But for such cases, whether landlord, tenant, or owner-occupant, I knew that I had an ally. For situations too difficult for me or my block captains to handle, the Housing Bureau could turn to the hard-hitting machinery of the housing court. Mr. Clark, your landlord has made a lot of improvements on his property. But tenants have duties and responsibilities, and you haven't lived up to yours. I find you guilty, but I'm going to make the fine very, very light. Just two dollars and costs. Provided you get that yard of yours cleaned up. And to help you do it, here are two of your neighbors. Mrs. Turner got to volunteer. You're a lucky man. Next case. Case of Thomas Gary. Well, Mr. Gary, welcome back for the third time. Your Honor, I stand on my rights as an American citizen. Mr. Gary, I find nothing in the Constitution of the United States which says a landlord may keep his property in a disgraceful condition. Mr. Gary, I could fine you $50 a day for every day these violations are not corrected. Is that what you want me to do? No, Your Honor. Well, that's what I'm going to do. You're guilty of 10 days violations. The fine is $500 and costs. $500. However, this court isn't interested in taking money away from either tenants or landlords. I suspend the fine if you'll put that $500 into fixing up your houses. Agreed? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And at this point, even Mr. Gary had to admit that punishment in Baltimore's housing court did, in fact, fit the crime. I was a bit surprised at his rather sudden character reformation, but there's no question about it. Mr. Gary is a changed man. Children playing in sunlit open spaces. This, to me, is a fitting symbol of our work. They played before, of course, but in alleys like this. And now they had something better. In fact, throughout the neighborhood, things had taken on a new look. In place of this, this. Blighted backyards had become flower gardens. Rat-infested alleys before and after. Cluttered backyards before and after. A neighborhood like this can become this. This, then, is the Baltimore plan. It cannot work miracles. There are slum areas beyond recovery. But for those areas worth rehabilitating, the Baltimore plan can work. And together with a program of redevelopment and new housing, both public and private, it can remake a city. <laughs> <laughs>